We're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. We are so glad to be able to minister to the youth in this church. Hallelujah, Lord. Be at work in those children's hearts. Let them grow up to have a strong faith in you that guides them throughout their life. Amen. That is awesome. Praise God. For the rest of us, this is the point in our service where we take up the tithes and the offerings. So Ackley, our usher, will be coming around. He's got the usher bag. He's got extra pens and envelopes. If you should need anything, feel free to flag him down. Or we have giving set up through PayPal if you prefer to give electronically. That's available for you. Thank you, God, for giving us options. But we want it to be an act of worship. It's just another way that we have to worship God. It is not an obligation. It is not a requirement that, oh, if you're not doing that, then you're not really a Christian. Mm, No. It's just another way that God gives us to worship Him. We appreciate you giving Him some of your time this week. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. And if you feel led to give financially, that's awesome. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for your generosity. We just sang that we want to see God's kingdom here in this world. Amen? Yes, absolutely. When I look around the world and look at the news, oh man, I wish it looked a little bit more like God's kingdom than what I actually see in the news, right? Amen. Well, look, your generosity, your generous giving helps us to bring about God's kingdom a little bit more in the world because where people are hurting, where people are have needs that enables us to go and meet some of those needs and bless people here in this community and all around the world this year has been rocked by this pandemic that hit the whole planet things are happening that are impacting people all over the world and we've been able to impact lives all over the world in Kathmandu Nepal in Cuba in Russia God is at work he's blessing our fellow believers in Christ and he's blessed us to be able to reach out to them and to help them and to meet needs. Thank you, God, and thank you for being a part of that. That is awesome. With God, we can get through anything. That is amazing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right, I'm going to pray briefly, and then we're going to continue in service. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for blessing Redemption Church to be a mighty church that's able to do mighty things in your world. Wonderful God, let everything we do bring about your kingdom and bring your kingdom to earth. Lord, we love you. We wish this earth looked more like your kingdom. Help us to reach out and meet needs. Direct us and the finances, the resources that you place in our hands. Guide us to go out and meet the needs that need to be met, to to bless people and to help people and to show them your love. Lord God, let everything that we do reflect your love out into the world today. Thank you, Lord, for every person in the room today. Thank you for every person tuning in online. Lord, I pray that you would bless them and be with them and let everything that they do bring glory to your name to build your kingdom in the world. Lord God, let other people see you through them and through the love that they share. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do, all that you brought us through so far and all that you will bring us through every day. Thank you, God. We love you. We trust in you and we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Is anybody about that dad life today? Anybody about it? <laughs> Welcome to Redemption Church, everybody. My name is Chris Fluid. I'm so glad to be with you on this Father's Day. Look at somebody say, Happy Father's Day. If at all possible, make sure that your father knows that it is Father's Day and that you appreciate them and that you love them. Give them a call, spend some time with them. The world needs good fathers, is that right? Yes. You bet it does. The world needs some good fathers. The world needs great men. And today I want to tell you about what makes great men. But first, we're in the second week of our series. What's the name of this series? Anybody remember? We'll just start back with week one, y'all. Fierce love is what it's called. Last week we talked to you about the fierce love of a warrior. We talked to you about warrior Jesus. Anybody, anybody know about warrior Jesus in here? We talked about a love that's willing to fight for you. And Jesus is a warrior and he knew when to turn the cheek and he knew when to turn a table. Fierce and love are not antonyms. They're not at odds with each other. They're not in disagreement. But because of love, we must be willing to struggle. We must be willing to fight. And so we need some fierce love. Are you with me today? Are you okay? Oh my gosh. All right. We told you every warrior needs three things. Remember them? Number one, someone to protect. Number two, a kingdom to advance. And number three, a battle to win. Today, we're going to be, uh, we're going to learn about a love that defends. A love that defends. Love is meant to fight for the safety of others. Love's not meant to fight for more money, bigger flat screen TVs, or newer car. Love is meant to fight for the safety of others. Love, love is meant to protect others from harm. Do you agree with that? Love should cause you to protect others physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 6 through 7. Uh, 1 Corinthians is the love chapter. You knew this right. It tells us that love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Verse 7, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love always protects, always. Even when it's not convenient, it still protects. Even when it's costly, it protects. Even when it's not deserved. Some people don't deserve your protection, but you love them. And so you protect them anyway. It always protects. Is there a time love doesn't protect? Not according to 1 Corinthians 13. A love that defends. You know, you know how defense works, right? If you do, you should call the Dallas Cowboys. But doom, that was real good. That wasn't even in my notes. That was just the spirit giving utterance. Now, I want to tell you that protection and defense works this way. It's really complicated. Defense is placing yourself between an attacker and the victim. That's how a defense works. Love will place itself in harm's way. Love will position itself between the attacker, the attacker and the victim. And then through love, a defender will become an obstacle to that attacker. If you're going to get to them, you have to go through me. Love always protects. Do you know that the world needs a love that defends? Do you agree with that? Oh my goodness. When 25 million people are trapped within human trafficking, I would say that we need a love that would stand up and defend. When 20 million Americans age 12 and older suffer drug addiction, I would say somebody needs to position themselves as an obstacle between the next addiction. When 821 million people in the world do not have enough to eat, 821, that is around one in nine people on the face of this planet do not have enough to 
to eat. When 17 million children become orphans because of AIDS. Because AIDS has killed their parents in sub-Saharan Africa. Somebody needs to step up. Somebody needs to defend somebody. Somebody needs to protect. When every year over 23,000 children age out of foster care and adoption systems. They age out of it without ever knowing the love of a mother or father. And they enter this world with no family support system. I would say somebody needs to step up. Love always protects. Where are we? Over 600,000 babies, their lives are ended through abortion before they ever draw a breath. 567,000 homeless people are in this nation alone. 171,000 of them are homeless families. 37,000 of them are veterans. 35,000 are unaccompanied youth. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death. 48,000 committed suicide in 2018. 1.4 attempted suicide in 2018. There are 132 suicides a day. More than 264 million people are suffering from some sort of depression. We could go on and on. Some of you already have the next stat in your head. Here's the point. We're living in a world that needs a love of a warrior who will step up and say, no more. No, I'm not going to let that happen to this person. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to be a defender. Am I in a church that says, yes, yes, that's us. Yes, that's who we are called to be. This world needs a love that defends. This world doesn't need a voice that loves to hear itself quote the stats so that you reelect them into office or something or that you give them some money that never quite makes it to the need. Broken world, that's what we do. This world needs a love that will find a position. Find where the attack's coming from and find the victim and will stand in between it yes. till it stops. Oh right. yes. This world needs a love that will become an obstacle for evil. Yes. Church, that's what we're supposed to be. We are supposed to be an obstacle for evil. This news of a love that defends, a love that protects, is countercultural. It's countercultural to what the world preaches to us that love is. Do you realize that? The movies, the stories, the art, the music, the narrative of our world tells us that love is about receiving. Somebody said receiving. receiving. Our society preaches that, that love is all about receiving. Receiving something, right? Every kiss begins with K, right? Oh my, he went to Jared. He must really love me. I mean, this is, we, we have these commercials all the time. It's the December to remember. And oh my God, it's not Christmas until someone looks out and sees a brand new car with a big bow on it. And they are $60,000 in debt. But you know, they, that doesn't hit. The video doesn't show that. That happens at, later in January. So receiving stuff, receiving re material gain. That's what our society preaches that love is. Or, or that receiving pleasure and affection. That's love like to get physical with another person that's really what love is it's not love until those things happen or that they've said certain words and they've got to be words that you know make you feel something or they were words that were on some kind of television show drama or receiving attention and award he said he said I was hot he must love me. He, he, he flattered me. That must mean we are good to go forever. 
oh my goodness, we have a relationship that will never end. He, he said my shoes were pink. It's just, or anybody remember Sally Field? She wins an Oscar. She runs up there and I don't know if she wrote these lines, but they came out of her mouth sure as anything. She said, you like me. You really like me. Why? Because she won an award, receiving a praise from somebody, an award. Is that what love is? That is what society has preached to us, that it is. The world tells us that love is about receiving. It's a what have you done for me lately kind of world. Yet God's world, God's word is completely different. What do you think God's word says? God's word is not about receiving. God's word says that love is about giving. How upside down is the kingdom of God? Let's hit just some scriptures. John 3, 16, you ought to know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He loved the world so much that he gave 1 John chapter 4 9 through 11 this is how God showed us his love among us he he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him this is love not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins verse 11 dear friends since God so loved us we ought to love one another. Ephesians chapter 2, 4 through 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace, the grace that came from God, that we are saved. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know that Christ did not come to receive? He didn't come to receive. He didn't come. He was the king of kings, but he didn't come say, all right, guys, where's my crown? Oh, guys, where, where do I set up my throne? No, he did not come to receive. He came to give. In love, Jesus positioned himself between us and an accuser. Between us and an attacker named Satan. Isn't that what he did? Where did he position himself? Well, we could talk about that. He was born in a poor home. He was born in the outskirts. He was born in a racist society. He was born middle class, maybe. Maybe lower class. He was raised in all things. But the greatest position of all is the cross. On that cross, he literally positions himself between all those that are going to hell and the attacker. That's what he did. And he took the full brunt of that punishment. Do you know what I'm talking about today? I'm talking about the cross. Anybody love Jesus in this place? Is anybody thankful for that kind of love that would position itself to protect me even though I don't deserve it? Today is Father's Day. The world needs some good men that are not just going to sit on a lazy boy couch, but will get up and defend someone, position themselves in a way that will save someone else's life. The world needs some great men who will love, in love, will defend. I want to tell you two things that make a great man. Two things that make a great man. These two things are not just limited to men, ladies. We love you too. Ladies, you two can absolutely be great if you have these two things. But, because it's Father's Day, I want to talk to men for a little bit. Y'all listen up. I will argue, men, that if you have only one of these two things, you will never be great. You need to have both of these two things. Are you interested in knowing what these two things are? Kindness and strength will make a great man. Say it. Kindness Kindness. 
and say strength. Now this is a really simple concept. Please get it. You need a kindness that will cause you to love others and have a motivation that is ruled by love. It's every motivation is love. You need that kind of kindness. But you also need a strength that can stand up and fight. If you have one but not the other, you will never be great. If you have all the kindness to make the world a better place, you ever made a person that, like that man there, just the most kind-hearted person. I've met some really kind people. But if you have all the kindness in the world to make the world a better place, but you don't have the strength to stand up against the attack of evil, then you really don't have anything more than good atten- intentions. Somebody say amen if I'm anywhere near the truth today. There are people that have a kind heart. They think nice things. But at the end of the day, they never stand up in the fight. They always position themselves away from the struggle. This person has good heart. But they're only good intentions. With kindness alone, you become something called an enabler. And that doesn't help anybody. Enabling someone is very destructive. If you have strength but lack kindness, I would say in this world we understand that one a little bit closer, don't we? If you have a lot of strength, if you have a lot of influence, you have a lot of power, and you have no kindness, guess what? You end up becoming an abuser. Am I right? If you want to do great things in this world, you're going to need both. You're going to need kindness and you're going to need strength. I want to tell you today that kindness and strength are not opposites. Maybe there's a part of your brain that go, I don't know. It kind of feels like maybe they're opposites. Like you see strength, it's like this sergeant running around yelling at people. And then kindness is Mary Poppins, you know, and she's like, just a spoonful of sugar. And there's like a little bird on her finger. And that's, that's your picture of kindness. And then this yelling sergeant, that's your picture of strength. I want, I want to argue today that in love, kindness without strength is not really being kind. Now you'll stick with me. That person that seems really kind, if they have kindness but they don't have strength, they are not really kind. Because enabling is completely destructive. Oh, I'm going to do drugs, mom and dad. Oh, right ahead, son. We would never want to say anything that would upset you. You know what? It's your life, son. You go out and you do whatever you want. That is what an enabler does. That's what I see a problem. But you know, I'm so kind. I just have trouble confronting things. I like to just go home and make muffins. <laughs> Nothing wrong with muffins, my God. But that kindness without strength enables people to walk right off a cliff. And does that look so kind? It's not. Enabling is not kind, but it is destructive. In fact, the Bible says it is hatred. hatred. Y'all know the scripture I'm talking about. It's Proverbs 3.24. It says, to spare the rod of correction from your child is to hate your child. Yeah, we, we've loved to Americanize that and say spoil for some reason. But your Bible says that if you withhold the rod of correction... You are actually hating your child. That that rod of correction, that belt, that punishment is actually good for them. And you withholding it is actually hatred. You giving it to them is actually loving. Real kindness is sometimes looking somebody in the face and saying the thing you are uncomfortable saying. Real kindness is sometimes saying, we've got to talk. We have got to change things around here. Don't think that that is having a bad attitude. Don't think 
that that is wrong. What's wrong is to allow people to walk right off a cliff because of your sensibilities. That, my friends, is not kind. It is actually hateful. Kindness without strength is not really kind at all. Well, what about strength? My gosh, does the world love strength? The world loves strength so much. There's, there's certain people that they walk in a room, they've got that command of strength. And everybody's like, oh man, who's that person? At least I'm told that. I've never actually experienced that myself, Leroy. But I'm told, I'm told these are things that happen. Tall, dark, and handsome if the lights are off, I got the dark covered. But that, that's it. I want to argue that strength without kindness isn't really strong. Strength without kindness is not really strong. All right, back that up, preacher. All right, I'll do my best. Using your strength for your own prideful and selfish gain is actually what comes natural. It's actually what is easy. The two-year-old tyrant child doesn't have to be taught this. It's mine. He'll walk right up to you and say, my phone. And it's not his phone. You're the one that pays the bill, but he grabs that. Anyway, but why? Because that becomes natural for them. Selfishness and pride isn't a, something amazing. It isn't a talent. It's not a strength. It's natural. It's actually incredibly easy to do. You want to know what strong is? It's resisting pride. And it's resisting ego. And it is resisting a me, me, me mentality. My friends, that is real strength in this world. That is what real strength looks like. Real strength is, is displayed when you say no to yourself. And you instead choose kindness. Using your strength to abuse others and gain for yourself, that's weakness. And everybody's done it. So strength without kindness, it's not really strong at all. It's predictable. It's predictable. That's why everybody's got those trust issues. Oh my gosh, this person's got a little pro power over me. Watch them destroy me. You predict it because it is predictable. It's nothing strong about it. If the two-year-old can do it, it's not a big deal when a, when a politician can do it. Strength without kindness isn't really strong at all. I want to argue that strength without kindness is strong and kindness without strength isn't kind. Fierce love is found when we have kindness and we have strength. There is a very biblical term for when kindness and strength come together. You know this biblical term? It's called meekness. It's one of the most misunderstood words in the English language. People hear the word meekness and people think the word weakness every time, right? What does weakness mean? Well, it means, you know, it means, you know, you're Mary Poppins, you're a little weak, you know, you know, somebody comes, has a problem, you probably, you know, oh, go right ahead. You know, that is not what meekness is at all. Not at all. Meekness is the balance of kindness and strength. The real definition of meekness is this. It is strength under control. Abuse happens when strength goes completely out of control. The best visual I've ever received was from a um, pastor friend of mine, David Fuller. He said, strength, meekness is a strength that's so under control. He, he, he said, imagine a jackhammer and that jackhammer just destroys anything it touches. And it's hard to control. It's just moving you all around and you're doing your best to hold it in place. But it is hard to control that strength. In fact, everything it, it touches, it ends up destroying. Now imagine if you could take that same strength, but you could do something delicate that wouldn't crush something. Imagine if you were able to, to crack a walnut and get everything out of it without it destroying it. Imagine if you were able to take that same power and strength from the jackhammer and use it under a controlled way 
to clip a fingernail without destroying a hand. That is what meekness is. Meekness is not a lack of strength. Meekness is strength completely under control. It's strength, but not letting my temper get the best of me. It is strength, but not letting my ego get in the driver's seat. It is strength that is completely tempered with kindness. Kindness, strength together. Biblical term for it is meekness. Everybody said meekness. We need some meek dads. We need some meek moms. We need some people that are both kind and strong. We need some meek families. We need, we need some beaten families that are just full of kindness, but they are not pushovers. They're also very strong. We need a church in Plano, Texas that's meek. That's full of kindness and full of strength. We need to be kind enough, loving enough to take an interest in someone else's life. We need to be strong enough to look people in the eye and become an obstacle to the attack. Jesus is strong and kind. Do you agree? You might accidentally confuse Jesus as kind and loving, but weak. As a pacifist, unable to combat, unable, unwilling to fight. There's a lot of people that have that picture that Jesus is just really good with animals. There's, you know, they've got some pictures out there that Jesus is holding a lamb and then someone photoshopped Jesus is holding a velociraptor, but it's the same Jesus just loving little animals. No one knows that picture. Come on, it's on the internet. It's one, Lupita, I'm going to so share that on your Facebook soon. You'll be blessed. If you have trouble seeing Jesus being throw down tough, then I got a story for you. Matthew chapter 18, verse 2. He called a little child to him. He placed the child on among them I kind of picture Jesus is sitting down he's got the child on his knee don't you you with me Matthew chapter 18 verse 3 he said I truly I tell you unless you change to become like little children he's now teaching using the child unless you become like little children you will never enter the kingdom of heaven now this story is preached a lot you you see pictures of this story everybody's got a wonderful visual of this story It's obvious Jesus is so good with kids. He just loves kids. They're just so sweet. So sweet. Look how sweet it is. He's holding those children. He just loves those children. Sweet little Jesus. He's good with sheep and he's good with children. It's so good. Now this is not untrue. Jesus is gentle. Jesus is kind. Jesus is loving. Jesus values all people even children that were often overlooked in ancient society and are becoming overlooked in today's society. But there is more to the story. What happens next? Well, verse 6, Matthew 18. Jesus throws down a threat. Are you ready for threatening Jesus? Here he says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I don't know about you, but I kind of hear a Clint Eastwood Eastwood kind of voice here. It's like, go ahead. If anybody is to mess with one of these little ones in my kingdom, it would be better. You know what a millstone is? Millstones, one of these huge natural stones that they've hewn and now it's rolling across the wheat, across the grain and it crushes everything. It It is huge. They roll it. No one picks it up. Well, Jesus is saying, you know what? Somebody messes with me. They will wish. They will actually be better off if I would attach a millstone to their neck, throw them in the ocean. That's your Jesus right there. It is not Liam Neeson from Taken. It's Jesus. I have a particular set of skills. No, Jesus. If you haven't seen Taken, what kind of church are we in? My goodness. 
Listen, Jesus is one moment just sitting, playing with this child. And even while he's sitting, playing with this child, being sweet to this child, he throws out a threat. Don't you dare mess with mine. Anybody, and do you know who his is? Do you know who his mine is? It's you, child. You are his child. And he's saying it to the enemy. Anybody. He is positioning himself right there. Listen, before I get done with you, you're going to wish that I tied a millstone around your neck and just threw you into the sea. Do you know what hell is? Hell is a place for your enemies, for your attackers. And who am I talking about? No, I'm not talking about Larry from accounting or Karen who always comes in and sits at your table and never tips you. I am talking about the devil. I'm talking about the one who wants you dead. I'm talking about the one who has come to kill, steal, and destroy. And before it's all said and done, he will get off easy if he had a millstone tied around his neck. He is going to a lake of fire where there will never be a moment of peace for him again. Why is he doing this? Because that guy is your enemy. And he has positioned himself to take out every one of your enemies. That's our Jesus. He's kind. But don't you get it wrong, friend. He is not weak. He's strong. He is strong. He throws out a threat here. And I pity the fool that tries to come against you. His believers. I want to tell you Jesus is a defender. Are you with me today? There is a, is a world out there filled with people that need defense. They need your defense. We've talked about just a, just a little bit of that today. Sometimes you may need to defend people from themselves. When you talk about tricky, that's real tricky. See, I know how to position myself between an attacker and a victim. That makes sense logistically. There's the attacker. Here I am. There's the victim, right? But what do you do when the attacker and the victim are the same person? Where do you stand? There. Where, how, do you, how do you do that? Lobotomy? Is, is that how that works? There are times where you have to look people in the eye and tell them to stop. Tell them that they're destroying themselves. For some of you, that's like, I don't know if I could do that. Oh, you will do that if you love them. You listen to me. You will do that if you love them. It's not fun, but it's needed. It's necessary. It... It's not an attempt to control people. Don't, don't buy that. Oh, I don't want to control people. No, it's not an attempt to control people. It's an attempt to influence people from wrecking their life. It's an, inf- it's, it's an attempt to influence people from going on their way to hell. It's an attempt to save people. It's an attempt to truly love people. Don't you let, oh, I don't want to control people, so I'm just going to mind my own business. You will not mind your own business if you love these people. It does not mean that you're trying to defend someone from themselves. And because you're doing that, you must have all your stuff together. It must mean that you're perfect. Well, you know, and this is a, you even have a scripture you can quote on this, but you know, I figure I should worry about my own self, you know, before I, you know, go and and touch any of, of their stuff, you know, that, you know, the, the big log in your eye versus the, the little speck in, in your eye. You know, you listen to me. There are places to use that scripture. But don't you dare compromise and don't you dare take the weak way out. If you really are kind about these people and God has allowed you to see clearly what's going on, he has given you the wisdom to see it and he has given you a mouth to speak. So my goodness, you need to stand up. No, this is not an admission that you have everything together. No, this is an admission that we both need the mercy of God. Come with me to the house of God. We'll find mercy there. We'll find love there. We'll find hope there. Come with me. Oh, and these are things we tell ourselves to keep us out of the struggle. 
And let's face it, it is so much easier to stay out of the struggle. It's not the strength. The strength is going in there and carrying that burden. It means that in your kindness, you actually do more than have heart feelings. You care outwardly. You care more about them living than what they may think about you. That's a bridge we all need to cross. For many, growing up, many, many of my friends, I would not tell them about Jesus because I was worried what they would think about me. Oh, was that kind? Was that, well, I, you know, I don't want to offend them. I don't want to get in a struggle, you know. I want to I stay their friend. Oh, really? Were you their friend? Is that, is that what you call friendship? Is that real kindness? It is unkind and it's weak. It's both. It's the worst of both worlds. Congratulations. When you enter into this struggle, it means that in your kindness, you're actually caring. When you enter into this struggle, it means that in your strength, you actually are taking responsibility. You're going to actually use some of that strength. I, as a pastor, and as a father figure, it's kind of the weird, one of the weird things about being a pastor. I never really thought about that before I followed the Lord into this. But no, I, I actually serve as a father figure to several people, to many people more than maybe I even understand. So as a pastor, as a father figure, sometimes I have to sit down and tell them, hey, you're destroying your life. You're destroying your marriage. This is how, this is headed for divorce, y'all. I have to say those things. I have to say, this is destroying your future. What you're doing with your credit card is destroying your future. What you're doing with your body is destroying your future. What you're doing right now is destroying the opportunity that God has given you. He's given you an opportunity. It is straight from the throne. He has something for you to do in life and you are completely wrecking it. It will never happen unless you change right now. And you know what? When I'm telling people this, no one ever thanks me <laughs> in that moment. No one's ever like, I just say, and that's how you're gonna ruin your life, Tria. And Tria, they never say, well, thank you, pastor. That was really helpful. <laughs> no, you know what? They get mad at me. They get upset with me. Some of them, it gets awkward. They cry. Some of them make weird faces at me. There's a part of me that's like, don't ever stop talking because if you stop talking, then they'll start talking and then that's when it gets mean. And sure enough, that plays out. It's true. It's a thing. It's a thing. No one has ever said, thank you, pastor. You're absolutely right. When you are positioning yourself between the attack, the attacker and the victim that happens to be the same person, oh my goodness. They won't immediately find you so helpful. I've been yelled at. I've been personally attacked. Some people have left the church, but can I tell you, what do you expect? Defenders position themselves in harm's way. If you're a defender, you decide that before you run into the burning building. You see, that's what first responders have to do. That's what policemen have to do. That is what, what firemen have to do. That's what EMTs have to do. I'm going to this situation. I am going to position myself in harm's way. Yes, I could get hurt. Yes, I could even die. But I am going to go help someone. And before they ever arrive to the scene, they decide that church, we need to decide today, right now, that we are defenders of people. So that when we see someone in trouble, we don't have to decide, will I enter it? No, we run right into the fray. Defenders position themselves in harm's way. Get over it. They're going to say harmful things. I'm getting ready for teenagers. I've had a little bit of practice with Alex living with us, getting some 
teenage practice with me, that young man. I love him to death. But it's not all a bed of roses, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> Defending people will get you hurt. But here's what I want you to know. People are worth it. What Jesus would tell you from the cross with the blood still pouring down from his face, he would say, the people are worth it. Father, forgive them. He would say, you know, what he, if he gave commentary, if there was commentary from Jesus while it's going through his hands and you saw the video footage, he would give that DVD commentary and would say, this really did hurt, but you're worth it. I love you this much. And that foot, yes, it hurt. It was excruciating, but I never even thought about giving up. I was there for you. And the ridicule, it tore me apart. They said things about me that weren't true, but you, child, you're worth it. And we are going to be in paradise together forever. You're worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it. That's Jesus' commentary, y'all. Oh, Jesus. You walk into the fray. You get hit. There are times you think, why do I even do this? That's natural. But you just wait. You wait. Maybe a month. Maybe a year. Maybe way down the road later in life. You wait for that person that you spoke to. You wait for that phone call. You wait for that text message. You wait for them to walk up to you. And they say, thank you. You wait for them to say, you were a warrior for me. You fought for me. I hated your guts. I hated what you said. I thought you were wrong. I thought you were stupid. But you were right. And I treated you so bad. And you still kept coming after me. Thank you. You just wait for that moment. Have you ever had that moment? Church, we need to be filled with those moments. We've got young teenagers. We've got some young children. We've got some young married couples. We've got some people that are just young in the Lord and they're going to make some dumb mistakes. They need somebody to defend them. They need somebody to love them. They need somebody not to pick up stones against them. But what if we just picked up stones and said, come at me, bro. Come at me, bro. Just try to hurt them. You just try to hurt my friend. You just try to hurt this child in the Lord. You, we, we pick up the stones and we face the wrong way. You just wait for that moment. When they say, thank you for getting in my face, it's actually what I needed. Thank you for being a warrior of kindness and strength. This is my prayer. Um, the... This day, this hit me really hard today. This prayer, it's just a simple prayer. Lord, help my kindness never run without strength. Lord, help my strength never run without kindness. Would you make that prayer right now? Lord, help, help my kindness never run without strength. Lord, don't ever let my kindness like, just pat myself on the back without actually getting up and doing something. And Lord, help my strength never run without kindness. Lord, let every bit of authority you've given me as a dad, as a, as a husband, as a pastor, Lord, let every bit of it run with kindness and run with loving, the loving, tender-hearted love of Jesus Christ. Let this be your prayer today. You listening online, make that your prayer today. Write it down. Remember it. Put it somewhere. Pray it. God wants to provide kindness and strength today and he can provide it both. He can, he can make you a great person right now. He can provide greatness, kindness and strength today. God says this to Paul. It's a little different version. It's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my kindness and strength is enough for you. When you are weak, my power is is strong. Other versions say, you know, my, my grace is sufficient for you. But in this world English, it just caught my attention this week. It said, my kindness and strength is enough for you. 
Paul was going through all kinds of crazy stuff. Paul went through periods where he felt all alone. But the Lord was right. And that's why he wrote this down. The Lord says, my kindness, my strength is enough for you. Will you just receive my kindness and my strength? Jesus is strong enough to fight for you. And he is kind enough to lift you up and never throw you away. He is kind and he is strength. And Jesus, I want that kindness and strength to be found in me so that I can live that kind of life for my children. So I can live that kind of life to other people in society. We're, we're at a weird place in society where it's like you just don't know how every conversation's going to go right now. It's really stressful. But God's kindness and his strength is enough for Paul? Is it enough for you? And can his kindness and strength just take grip of your heart? Can it take grip of your thoughts? Can it take grip of your mind and your mouth and the words? Oh, his kindness and his strength is enough for me so that even when I'm weak, get this, he's in a jail cell later in life. Weak. Nobody's there. There are times that nobody's there. They all get away from him because he's in chains. Unloved, uncared for, unkind. Weak, unkindness everywhere. I want to tell you that even then, God's kindness and God's strength was enough for Paul. It's enough for me too. Are there any warriors here that want to receive the kindness and strength from the Lord? I feel so good right now. I just feel God's love just washing over me. It's a wonderful scripture that says his kindness brings us to repentance. I love that verse. It's his kindness that brings us to repentance. It's not his heavy hand crushing us that brings us to repentance. It's not even... Not, not even like miracles so much that, that bring you to repentance. It's his utter love for you. You feel it. And you know that he's a good God. Brings you to repentance. Do you feel that kindness in this room today? Can you let it draw you to that place of repentance today? Can you receive a strength from the Lord today? Are you a defender? We're about to come. Ask the Lord to help us be more like Jesus in this area. But I want to tell you one more thing. Will you, will you be patient enough for one more thing? You shouldn't have to defend yourself. When I was putting together what is this sermon series about four months ago, this idea started the whole thing. Gosh, I want to give it to you. You shouldn't have to defend yourself. I was just in this weird little place where there are these, there's some people that don't like me. They hate my guts. There's just certain people that don't like me. It's always that way in life. I really like to be liked. But some people don't like me. And I just got why? It's like, and this just simple thought it says, let me defend you. They, they're saying bad things about me, God, but God said, let me defend you. And then I felt the Lord just say so simply, you shouldn't have to defend yourself. You always get so defensive, Chris Fluitt. When people look at you wrong or say the wrong thing, you let that, that thing hit your heart and you get all defensive on it. Like you are, you have to find, defend yourself. And then all the, the, the talks go on in your head. You know what I'm talking about? The arguments, like you're not actually arguing, but you're picturing it and you're imagining it and they're gonna say this, I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna say this, and they're gonna say this, and then I'm gonna get them with this uppercut blow and there's like, and you're the jerk now. Defensive. The Lord says, you shouldn't have to defend yourself. So I hate that defensive feeling. Do you? I, I feel like, need to defend myself maybe someone said something did something and you know the awkward position where you have to defend yourself well you should never have to do that the people that love you 
the family that loves you, the church that loves you, and the God that loves you should come to your defense. Lord, help me get in a place where I just, I'm done defending myself and I allow Jesus Christ to come defend me. I allow the friends in my life that I just allow them to be my defense. Not in a gossipy way, well, they're going to go write something on Facebook about, no, that they defend me, that they pray for me, and they love me, and they say, you don't listen to them. You, you don't even do it. Look at, get me in the face and go, don't you dare do this again, fluid. I need it, I need it. Let someone defend me even from my own self. You shouldn't have to defend yourself. Those that love you should surround you and they should be your defense. The people in your life should not have to defend themselves. You should cover them. You should be their defense. Maybe you've kind of walked past people that are hurting. I'm going to tell you, you go walk in there and you surround them with your love. You defend them with your love. You lift them up with kindness and strength. For sure, we need to allow God to be our defense. So stop trying to defend yourself. Let God be your defense. Here's what Psalm 94, 22 says, but the Lord has become my defense and my God, the rock in whom I take refuge. Will you allow the Lord to become your defense today. We're going to come pray. You can come right now. Come. If you are in a place that I just said something that really hit you, that you need defense, I want you to come in the first few feet of this church. I want you to come right here. And I want you to allow people that love you to surround you and pray for you and defend you and pray love on you, pray kindness on you and pray strength for you. I want you to allow people that don't think the worst about you to come around you and defend you. Will you do that today? Friends listening, watching online, God loves you. His kindness is for you. His strength is for you. He loves you. And I want you to feel at least half of what I'm feeling right now. I feel the love of Jesus drawing me and healing me of things I don't even know I need to be healed of. He's doing it right now. Father, we reach out to you. We ask you, God, to come and minister to us. God, come and be our defense. God, come and surround us. God, come and help us to position ourselves in a world that is losing this battle. They are losing hope and they're losing peace. God, help us right now to come position ourselves and love people. Help us to bring your kindness and strength in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Let's reach out to the Lord. Let's reach out to the Lord. Let's pray for a world that needs defense. Oh, Jesus, help us to be defenders in your name, in your name, in your name. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. We want to hear from you, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or even our anonymous question text line at 214-856-0550. Thank you for joining us and have a blessed day.